Hello, welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I'm very excited to bring the conversation I had with Andrew Jones. Uh, Andrew is an uh, impact fellow for humanities, arts, and social science. He's working at the intersection between academia and professional services uh, to promote and understand interdisciplinary research. Uh, he's also working on a second amendment with the knowledge uh, transfer partnership team uh, within uh, how to create more uh, knowledge uh, transfer within the humanities and social sciences. He's been uh, previously a postdoc researcher for theology and religion department at Exeter, and he is also the author of the new book, uh, How Kant Matters for Biology, which is uh, what we talk about. We talk about first the philosophy of science and why, what that is and why that's important. We talk about Kant's influence on biology. We talk about uh, transcendental idealism of Kant for biology, his idea of the natural world and reality. We talk about Straussian interactions with, uh, with Kant, uh, the importance of distinct disciplines. Uh, we talk about some of the spiritualism in biology, impact of judgment on science, Lenore and his thoughts on Kant, Kant and Hume, uh, Hewell's thinking on Kant, Kant's relevance for Darwin, uh, Kant's ideas on biological organisms, and uh, many other topics. Uh, again, I, I really... I've talked about Kant on the podcast uh, in, in different ways, but I always really like talking to folks that take one aspect of, of a major philosopher uh, and really try to look at what that looks like specifically. Many times it's a lot of overview, it's a lot of surveys, but really to try and get into the details of one aspect of their philosophy or how it's applied. And, and that's what Andy does. He's, he's uh, absolutely fantastic. He's great at explaining things very easily. Uh, his book is fabulous, and I, I can't recommend it highly. Um, you can find this conversation and all past and upcoming conversations at Converging Dialogues at Substack.com. Uh, you can also find me on YouTube. So just uh, get over there, subscribe, um, follow, share with your friends, and uh, engage. I always like to hear from folks. And uh, I bring you Andrew Jones. I am here with Andrew Jones. Andrew, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. Um, so you have uh, written a, a fantastic book, which I thought was super interesting. I had a great time reading it, and I wanted to talk to you uh, all about it. Uh, before we do, um, why don't you tell listeners uh, who you are, uh, what your background's in, what you're both professionally or academically, and uh, what you're currently working on, what you're doing. Great. Um, so um, I'm Andy Jones. Um, I live in Exeter, UK. Um, I've trained in philosophy. So I started doing an undergraduate in philosophy, um, which was a straight philosophy course in, in a university in Bristol called UWE. It's quite a small department. It's a brilliant department. I kind of landed there out of chance. Um, I didn't do very well in my my, my kind of college education, but um, but but it's one of those kind of degree programs which has a lot of added value so so you can go in with not very much and, and get like a really good support so so I did an undergraduate degree in straight philosophy and then a master's degree in um, continental philosophy and European philosophy nice. um, and then stayed at UE for a while teaching on their on their undergraduate program and then went and did a, a PhD at um, Cardiff University um, basically what this book is is kind of that that was the, the first rendition of this book was was looking at how Kant's influence was well, how Kant was influential for the development to biology um, and trying to figure out kind of on the one side the historical part of that question and on the other side kind of why that matters for contemporary philosophy of biology so, so I was super lucky in, in the way that I was funded that on the on the one side um, I had a supervisor in Cardiff University um, someone called Christopher Norris who's a critical theorist by training um, mm -hmm. not a big Kant scholar which I think you know ended up being something good for me but, but yeah. also I had a, a second supervisor down here um, a guy called John Dupre who's a philosopher of science um, kind of process biology also not a Kant philosopher mm -hmm. but it was interesting to get those kind of um, different perspectives on mm -hmm. on on my own project and being able to kind of see where their um, kind of guidance led me in terms of, you know, the, the content of this book, essentially. Mm. So, yeah, after that, I moved into um, a, a postdoctoral position at University of Exeter. I got a, a place on a um, kind of, it was an international project called God in the Book of Nature, um, started in 2019 as a Templeton funded project. It was um, led by Mark Harris, who's a theologian in Edinburgh. And I had um, a kind of lead supervisor here called um, Christopher Southgate, um, and he's, he's based in, in Exeter and stayed here for 
three years doing that project. Um, you know, something happened in that time. It changed the way that we did research. And it was supposed to be this big kind of international project, which uh, took me all over the world. Um, but it didn't do that, surprisingly, because, you know, COVID happened and we all got locked inside for a while. But what it did do is it led me to... Um, exploring the themes of this book on one side in a more kind of theological context and kind of building it into the book that it is today, but also starting to engage with other projects. So I've been working on projects which are, which are not really to do with this book, like directly, but like looking at the um, the impact of um, fungicides in farming and arable farming, mm -hmm. and also working with physicists in Bristol, um, looking at uh, developing an ethics of nuclear industries, right? So, so it's that sense that, you know, people who work in nuclear don't get taught ethics very much. And if they're interested in ethics, then they have to go and start kind of reading Aristotle. And, and there's not a lot which is directly relevant to them in Aristotle. So we're looking at whether we could tailor these kind of um, packages for them specifically so, so that when they go into those rooms as kind of, you know, as their career would would um, kind of demand of them and, and they can't talk about what they talk about in those rooms, we could at least kind of equip them with some, you know, kind of basic ethical vocabulary to be, um, kind of guiding them in those conversations. So, yeah, and then from that, I, I'm no longer an academic in the strict sense. Um, so I now work in the kind of professional services side of the university. So, so that's where we, I now support academics to commercialize their own research. But I would say that I'm always led by that kind of... Um, that notion of research, which is about big ethical questions and how that matters for um, for the issues that we're dealing with today. So, and that does feed back into the book, I think, and we'll, we'll see how that works. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's great. It's, it's interesting, you know, if, if people if people ever say, you know, there's, there's not much you can do uh, practically with philosophy, they would be very wrong as, as evidenced by a lot of uh, all the things you just listed off. And it's wild. I mean, the, the book feels that way in a nice cohesive way. It's, You've got a you got a lot of history in there. You got philosophy. You got some you know, physical sciences. You, uh, there's the theological. But you've got all these, all this like uh, multidisciplinary kinds of things coming in at once, which is uh, which is great. The book is called How Kant Matters for Biology: A Philosophical History, uh, and uh, that's um, all of the things that uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into. So I guess the first question I have here is how. How does a history of philosophy um, or, and, or a philosophy of science, how do both of those things together, because I, I do think a philosophy of science is super important, how do they help us understand uh, physical and to, the, to a certain extent social sciences um, as being tied with philosophy? So in other ways, instead of all of these disciplines kind of being in their own kind of departments and camps, you know, at university or academia or, or, or anywhere, how do we have a, this bridging of sorts to say, like, look, you know, Kant was was thinking about the world and all the many aspects of the world, uh, which would include how there's this impact on the so the, the the physical sciences, and how do we how do we bridge those things, whether it's with these two topics or just kind of generally with disciplines? How do you, how do you see the role in that uh, at the, at this juncture in time? Um, so I think like. The first point, which I, which I think is relatively uncontroversial, is that science is historical, right? You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. something that is embedded in history. Um, it's changed throughout history. And there's a sense in which when you're, I think when you're learning a particular scientific method, that, that's sometimes pushed to the wayside, you know, that it's, that it's not given forefront um, in, in, in the way that we teach science is that it has undergone this kind of historical development. So, so when we start seeing science as... Um, well, because because obviously, like um, Thomas Kuhn is an, an important person in the book who who picks up on these ideas of science being historical. Um, but when we start viewing science as that kind of um, fundamentally historical process, it, it changes what we think we're doing when we're engaging in science. Um, and that is already kind of zooming out to the kind of philosophical or historical level, you know, to, to begin with. I mean, I think that from the philosophical side, it's more that if if we can agree with kind of basic premises about what science is doing, so science depends on funding, for instance, yeah, So, um, and it depends on you know people being in positions of power at any one time in history in order to decide what does and does not kind of reach the mark of, um, of scientific relevance. Um, and I think that if we can agree on those kind of basic principles, it's, it's not so much... I think what I'm trying to push back from is, say, like a constructivist conception of science. You know, I'm not saying that it's it's completely um, arbitrary what we do in science, but, but there is a sense in which what constitutes the science that we're interested in today, um, it has a certain kind of um, mark about the the kind of entities that we're interested in when we're doing science. Um, 
the, the kind of topics that we're interested in and, and other topics which could produce equally kind of valid scientific results um, might have been kind of pushed to the wayside for whatever reason. So I think in that sense, you know, we have to um, understand that the decisions that we make in science um, in a sense, have an impact on on what the structure of science looks like. You know what what the kind of content of science looks like. So, and that is philosophically philosophically relevant. So, whether things are kind of um, in biology, for instance, processes or substances, um, mm. that has a huge impact on the kind of entities that that kind of fit with our scientific paradigms. Mm. I, I think it's it's interesting. Also, we might talk about it someplace in the conversation. But this idea, you know, people many times will. Uh, I think overemphasize, you know, the, the science and the scientific method, and the scientific method is fantastic and it's great, and we should keep doing it. Nobody is is is. Uh, I'm at least not saying that that we shouldn't use it, but it it's not everything, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I think when you're building concepts or when you're looking for hypotheses, they come from a philosophy of something there's a there's a worldview there's a philosophy of of how you're seeing things and whether that's you know fully flushed out or not uh it's there and i think if we have a, a really good understanding of of philosophy and philosophical concepts that can really help inform even better science still using the scientific method but even better science um so so how do we get to, or how did you, I guess, get to Kant as the kind of vehicle, if you will, for understanding biology? Is it uh, the emphasis on rationality that he has, or what were, I guess, the the kind of um, early workings, I guess, of saying, Let, let's look at this relationship between Kant and his philosophy and the impact it has on, on uh, biology as we know it? Right. So um, I think that in the context of this book, it was that I was kind of drawn into it by other people talking about Kant in, in the kind of space that I was researching. So, so the idea was was that he is um, he's influential. Well, his, his influence on biology is something which is um, kind of widely accepted. Um, there was someone we'll talk about a bit more later. Um, Tim Denoir came up with an idea of um, this this kind of this this theory that that Kant was very influential on the development of um, biology in Germany, and that he was somehow kind of instrumental to to the way that biology unfolded. And um, someone called John Zumito responded to Lenoir and said that you know, this couldn't be the case because there's certain things within Kant's philosophy which makes him incompatible with the way that we view biology. So I was really interested in in that kind of dialogue, that back and forth, because you know Zumito would have claims like. Um, it was only by misunderstanding Kant that biology as a special science emerged. That's one of the, the kind of quotes that I use quite a lot in the book. And, and that's really interesting because it's on the one side showing that sure biologists may or may not have misunderstood Kant. That's that's one question. But but that idea that he was really, you know, the misunderstanding of him was what was important. Yeah. So so this idea that, you know, Zumito himself is saying that by misunderstanding Kant, science emerges, or biology emerges as a special science. Um but then he's also denying Kant's kind of influence because he's saying essentially that um, it was based on this misunderstanding and misunderstanding doesn't fit our kind of narrative of what counts as a good influence, right? So mm. so that's what drew me into the, the book generally. Um, I think that there's there's kind of different things going on in the contemporary context as well. So there's a lot of contemporary biologists and more philosophers of biology who appeal to Kant's philosophy to try and um, solve issues which they're dealing with. So, so for instance, um, biological autonomy is, is one field where they'll appeal to Kantian concepts of freedom to try and um, solve issues that, like uh, theoretical issues that they're having in terms of like self-organization or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or um, Stuart Kaufman, for instance, has referred to um, self-organizing entities as Kantian holes. And, and that has a similar kind of um, issue that, that Kant is being used in a way that is not necessarily compatible with his original writing, and that's being overlooked. So, so, so the book, in a way, is trying to like offer some clarity to to the way that Kant may have influenced the development of science, not just biology, but kind of science more generally. And then in that sense, you know, you're right to point to rationality as as what Kant offers, um, and and what Kant offers in terms of his philosophy is 
is a very rational system which, um, you know, in, in kind of broad strokes, denies knowledge of the existence of God, but makes room for faith. Um, it gives us an account of how reason structures or reason can be structured to give us kind of scientific knowledge, but only in relation to the way that we view the world. And then in the book, I look at how that influenced um, a Cambridge philosopher of science called William Huell, and how he transformed that back into um, not just a, a rational explanation, but a conception of science that required God at kind of its um, its centre, really. So, and, and I argue in the book that the reason why Pugh does that is because he's he's dissatisfied with Kant's account of um, science, or, or what Kant's philosophy kind of implicates science into. You know that it's just a science for us; that it's not really about the world; it's just about our understanding. Yeah. And Pugh goes, "I don't want it to be about that. I want it to be about kind of discovering, you know, nature. But nature as it was kind of designed by a kind of bigger entity. And then he has to bring God back into the picture." Mm. And then I go on to see how Pugh. Um, influence or certain aspects of Hill's philosophy influenced um, Darwin and, and how that led to a conception of science which sees that unity of science as very important. So it's that sense of just tracing the ideas and how those ideas kind of um, develop over time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's, it's, it's, it's very helpful, I think, because it, it, you're, you're kind of painting the picture of, of where we see the, this is maybe some of the historical stuff of how people were viewing Kant and his work at the time and, and what they were and weren't doing. And so there's plenty of people that interact with him. So which we'll, we'll, we'll discuss, but I guess, how do we, <clears throat> how do we understand a little bit, I guess, of, of Kant and transcendental idealism uh, to understand biology and, and how is biology inseparable from human judgment? Uh, I, I've talked about Kant uh, a few times on the podcast. There's some pretty long conversations <laughs> Usually with Kant, you can't you can't really do do a, a conversation about Kant's philosophy in in thirty minutes. Um, <laughs> it's 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 a little difficult. Um, yeah. And I had a conversation not that long ago about, um, but it, it, it wasn't about Kant specifically, but about idealism and realism. And, and yeah. so you bring up some of this stuff here, so it kind of give us the primer on 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 uh, transcendental idealism for Kant, but then how that helps understand biology and, 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 and link us there. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, like in a nutshell, what's really important about Kant's philosophy is that you start from experience, yeah? So you just have the way the world is presented to you. And, and then we think about what can we gather as certain from the way that the world is presented to us, yeah? So, so in terms of the book specifically, I, I, I play with the... The idea of naturalism in philosophy of biology a lot, yeah. So, so naturalism is the idea that you know the, the the good way to do science is to be a naturalist and and just to think that what we're doing is we're essentially reading nature as if it were a book. You know, we're not mm. we're not in, we're not kind of um, we're not manipulating it in any way necessarily. We're not changing it. We're just kind of learning from nature. You know, quite mm. passively in that sense. Mm -hmm. Whereas Kant's view is that we are. We're in an engagement with it. You know, we construct nature. So he thinks that space and time are human faculties. They 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 kind of belong to you know that we we can't separate them from experience. And he thinks that concepts are human faculties as well. So like for instance, the concept of causality. You know, Kant thinks that causality is about understanding how experience presents itself from within the context of experience, as opposed to being something about the world independent of experience. So that. I mean, it seems very counterintuitive, right? And um, in the book, I talk about Hume. And one of the reasons why I talk about Hume is because I think that there are good intuitive reasons why Kant moves, why Kant kind of builds from Hume's philosophy, which is all about that kind of nature, world-based approach, but Kant kind of internalizes it all. And I go, actually, you know, there's there's quite good arguments in Kant as to why we can't know things about the world independent of experience. And... Um, that's that's kind of my my starting point, and I think that's the on the one side that shows why Kant is such an, an odd figure to be coming up in discussions about biology, right? Because he is his philosophy is so odd, yeah. And I think a lot of the people using his philosophy don't really appreciate how odd it is in a way, yeah. So you know, when you hear a biologist going, "Oh yeah, you know these these things in nature are you know these self organizing entities are Kantian holes," mm. you go, "Well, you can't possibly like well you can't possibly have like engaged with the, the text to the point where we've got this nuance about you know it being about experience and not really about the world because you can't the problem is you can't really be a naturalist and be a Kantian at the same time right or that's the criticism at least mm. and and I try and just play with the idea 
that naturalism is such a big part of biology you know what what is it about biology that makes it so naturalistic or or does it contain these kind of values and concepts that that make us um like less certain of it just that that relationship of reading off and, and more about something about a relationship of our judgment and in that sense if if that is happening then Kant's philosophy could be a bit more um instructive for what we're doing in biology and that, that that's how the later chapters develop is to say so for instance you know we we don't really have a clear grasp of a single definition of, of um, organisms or biological individuals. Um, for instance, we have genetic entities, like, um, for instance, I use, I use the example of the Pando forest in the book. It's a huge, you know, forest. It's, um, they're, they're all genetically homogenous with one another, the trees, but they have this root system. So they're essentially one individual. Right. But then that's very different than the way we would categorize, say, um, a bobtail squid, which is a, a symbiotic entity, which um, lets these um, bacteria called Vibrio fishery into their kind of... Um, well, certain kind of um, pores in their body and once they get to certain des- densities they, they start glowing right so so the idea is is that the the unit of selection at that point is the is the kind of um, symbiotic organism as a whole mm-hmm. and, and you can't really separate the two but mm-hmm. then those two conceptions of a biological individual are incompatible with one another right so mm-hmm. these are sometimes called like problem cases in biology but they do show how judgment may play a role in the way that we organize biological individuals on the first part, this is the question I always have: is because we can't. I always find that the 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 challenges, I guess, with Kant is. I mean, obviously he's tremendous, but I mean, what is? Is it because we can't know something through experience? Doesn't mean it doesn't exist. We just don't know that it exists. I mean, how do you? How is this kind of question? relevant because the obvious thing would be like well if you don't know it then you know but but we can know a, there's a lot of things we can't know through experience that are influencing us so how, how does Kant kind of wrestle with these ideas about the nature of the world and reality so well so I think that the the, the point would be is that t- for us to have knowledge of the existence of something it does have to be empirical um mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that there are. It doesn't mean that the totality of what is is, you know, the empirical world, right? I mean, Kant has a moral philosophy. He has, you know, even mm-hmm. his account of um, organisms is in some way, kind of, he sees it as as bridging what you would call kind of his theoretical philosophy, which is his kind of epistemology or his metaphysics, and his um, practical philosophy, you know, his kind of morality. Yeah. And he sees, you know, teleology as kind of the intersection of those things, or physical teleology at least. Um, so he's not saying that we can't know that things well he's not saying that the totality of what is is experiential Mm -hmm. Um, he's just trying to carve off what the conditions of what the domain of the conditions of knowledge are essentially yeah so Mm -hmm. so i mean my interpretation of Kant would be that he's not denying the existence of um the something outside of experience which is causing our perceptions yeah because he doesn't want to be like um a Barclayan idealist, and I'll explain what that is. So, so a Barclayan idealist is, is someone who denies the existence of nature outside of thought. Yeah, everything is thought. It's it's our thoughts and it's God's thoughts, and that's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. there's no physical world at all. Mm-hmm. And Kant's not trying to become a Barclayan idealist. He's he's trying to say that we can't know what is underneath experience. Yeah, mm. um, and I think that that gets flipped by a lot of people. Or a lot of like, um, so so say Garv right after Kant publishes the first critique says that, you know, Kant's philosophy is basically saying that, um, it, it, well, the the way the world is is not the way that it's experienced. Yeah, you know, the way the world is is the thing in itself, mm-hmm. and we can't possibly have an experience of that. So so truth is something we can't really know. Yeah, mm-hmm. whereas I think it's the flip of that. You know, I think Kant is the truth is all about the empirical for Kant. Yeah, mm. that's the domain of truth and. He wants to open up that space for faith, for morality, you know, for for beauty, you know, for politics, for all these things that we don't know with the same level of certainty, right. but we, you know, kind of sometimes assume that we do, right? So, mm-hmm. yeah, it's nice. So, could you lay out some of Strawson's arguments against Kant being compatible with science? And so, this is sort of a similar theme here: is you know, is it only relatable by observable experience? What is that relationship between experience and metaphysical? So you just kind of give out Strawson's arguments uh, against I, Kant. I mean, so so what Strawson? So this is um, P. F. Strawson, because um, in the book I kind of talk about P. F. Strawson at one point and um, and Galen as well, his son. So in in different contexts, um, but P. F. Strawson 
I mean, he's he's responsible for essentially kind of rejuvenating, well, not not solely responsible, but but a big contributor to rejuvenating interest in in-count scholarship in kind of um, the Anglo-American world. Um, he wrote, wrote his text about um, fifty years ago called "The Bounds of Sense," and his project in that book was to was to try and like update Kant essentially, right? So mm. he kind of throughout the book goes, oh, I'm going to use this concept of the scientifically minded philosopher. And for all those aspects of Kant, which are incompatible with the scientifically minded philosopher, I'm just going to say, well, he must be wrong, you know, because science has shown that to be wrong. So, so for instance, um, when I said earlier that Kant views space and time as kind of dependent on the subject, mm-hmm. um, Strawson goes, but science has just shown that not to be the case, right? Mm. Um, or, for instance, um, Kant's conception of the self, which is very strange. Yeah. I mean, like, it, it is an odd conception of the self which he has, but he kind of thinks that the self kind of um, centralizes in what he calls the transcendental unity of apperception. And Strawson has very little time for that as well. You know, he thinks the self is this kind of um, physiologically embedded entity that has kind of a history and time and, and, and a substance. And he doesn't really see how Kant's arguments could... Um, well, could hold up today, basically, against what we know in science. And yeah. and, and my thought is that um, Kant does, I mean, it's basically this conception of, you know, Strawson is assuming naturalism as the stance of objectivity, right? You know, he's just saying, well, science has proven this to be the case, so, so we can't possibly hold this to be kind of um, philosophically relevant anymore. And um, it seems that in a lot of those cases, we haven't really come up with robust arguments if you were to take a Kantian perspective towards science, right? So, so I still think there's that sense in which, if you take a Kantian attitude towards science as something which is kind of um, first given to you by experience, um, and then you're trying to figure out how you order your experience in the world, um, there, there's still a lot of um, there's still a lot of ability ability to push back against Strawson's views, um, which is what I do in the book a bit more. But it, but it's more just to show that. The way that Strawson framed Kant, I mean, he's not trying to be authentically Kantian. He claims that he's not. Yeah, he says, mm. you know, this is this is me trying to, you know, update Kant and, and not be like a good Kant scholar. Mm. But he was very influential in the way that we now understand Kant in scholarship. So, mm. so that's why I introduce him as a kind of um, a first kind of historical moment in the way that Kant is understood in kind of um, Anglo-American scholarship. Is, yeah, is there is there like a way in which people are trying to recon through Strawson because he was doing this kind of updated kind of thing? Is that how people initially were were trying to read his arguments against Kant? I think it's had an impact, definitely. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's um, a that what would you call them? They're, they're a kind of group of thinkers who have been influenced by Strawson and people like Ray Langdon, for instance, who works on on Kant is um, definitely influenced by Strawson's account. I'm not sh- saying that she's kind of a Strawsonian or anything like that, but she definitely um, has that kind of introduction to Kant's um, philosophy. And I think that, and, and it's not um, specific to Strawson. Yeah, I mean, I think that with the with the kind of project that I'm doing, this idea that there's an authentic Kantian reading is, mm-hmm. you know, an ideal. If, if it even is an ideal, yeah, 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 sure, like, for sure, for sure. We're for all sure. reading kind of some interpretation into Kant and, and using him for our own kind of, you right. know, reasons and um, dispositions. But I think it's important for us to be explicit about what those dispositions are, right? So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so in certain parts of the book, I call my um, interpretation Kant-inspired rather than Kantian because I know that I'm manipulating certain parts of his work. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important for us as Kantians um, to be more clear about when we are deviating from the text because of the way that it's used by other disciplines, right? So because because we got into a situation now where you can have a reading of Kant where you could be a a, a reductivist, right? You could say, you know, biology is not a real science. It's a product of judgment. And I'm sure we'll come on to why that is soon. But um, and what really matters is physics. And you go, that's what Kant says, yeah. But then on the other side, you could have someone who says, you know, biology has these kind of special entities and they have these special qualities like purposes and um, mm-hmm. reproduction. And I'm a Kantian, you know. And it's weird that two scientists could meet in a room, both claim to be Kantians and yeah. have completely contradictory views. And I think we are partially to blame for that because of the way that we use Kant's philosophy, right? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let me, let me ask this. Let me, let me, let me take a, a, a diversion here. So I, I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting what I said in the beginning. So just 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 bear with my contradiction. There, while it's wonderful to have a lot of overlap, there is something to be said about um, maybe you maybe you, you might disagree. So you tell me what you think. But I think when people are doing 
physical science. So it's like biology in this sense. There's a certain set of rules and there's a there's a, a, a kind of script that goes there and there's a, there's a certain conceptualization of sorts. And when people are doing philosophy, that's a whole other set of rules and ways of doing things. And when, when people do um, sociology and when they do engineering and when they do law, right? Now, obviously, we can take many – I mean, I think philosophy is in everything. So, of course, we can take philo philosophical principles and concepts – and, and use it in those fields, without a doubt, no question. However, sometimes when you get really deep into things, if you have somebody that has this, if, put it another way, if I'm not going to go to a biologist to, to tell, for them to tell me about philosophy. Now, I hope they, they understand and use some philosophy for sure for, for developing uh, experiments and tests in the lab and things like that. But straight philosophy less so and vice versa i'm not going to go to a philosopher and to ask them to tell me everything about biology so where do we find i guess this is kind of ripping off your idea about like you know you can have two contents and they're going to have different interpretations yeah. and things like that i not that it needs to be this like um you know who's doing the closest Kant reading or the most authentic not necessarily that but that there are some spaces where the two worlds aren't going to overlap or collide nicely. There are just things that are just philosophy and just fit biology or physical sciences. I mean, how do you see this thing of like, yes, people overlap, but also people probably should stay in their own lanes on some things. What do you think about this kind of push-pull piece here? I mean, so I think there's there's always a different way to frame the things that we're doing, right? So so I think the problem with not having any overlap between different disciplines is that we misunderstand what it is to be a scientist. We, the scientists might not really think about what the significance of their research is in the broader context. Yeah, so I, I started this, you know, when I started my PhD, there was a lot of stuff going on in Exeter about Whitehead, you know, you know in terms of metaphysics and process ontology and stuff like that. And biologists loved whitehead because mm -hmm. he has this kind of um like he has a vocabulary that sounds very grand but mm -hmm. from a kantian perspective it also seems very like contentless in a way yeah, it's not really saying anything about anything it's uh, <laughs> it, it goes beyond experience so fast that i can understand why biologists like it or why you know kind of scientists or generally maybe physicists like it as well because what it's doing is it's giving them a um, metaphysical narrative for the work that they're engaged in, which makes mm. them feel like discoverers of the universe, right? Mm. Mm. Whereas a Kantian narrative in that sense is is much more humble. Yeah, it's like, oh, mm. well, you're just, you know, understanding how we understand things and it's not really about the world <laughs> at all, right? You know, the world in itself doesn't really exist, right? And, and the, the scientist is going to be like, well, that seems, you know, a bit more miserable about going to work tomorrow because now I'm just, you know, essentially doing that, a form of psychology almost, yes. Right. Yeah, um, right. So the, the thing is, is that, this overlap does naturally happen. Yeah, I think that um, mm -hmm. that when you're looking at um, there's some kind of one. One thing I was interested in for a while was how certain scientists move towards spiritualism given certain views. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like mm -hmm. Umbrella mm -hmm. and Buddhism and, uh, and and Stuart Kaufman and his stuff about um, he has a book called Reinventing the Sacred and it's this idea of like renaturalizing all that stuff which was you know seen as part of religion before. Um, and I was really interested in how. Like the psychology of doing science changes your view on religion and your you know view on kind of ontology essentially. Um, oh, yeah. And in the book, I suppose from a different perspective, um, and uh, we may talk about this is kind of I focus on Berlin a bit. So Isaiah Berlin and the way that he historically viewed the, yeah, the yeah, difference yeah, yeah. between history and yeah, yeah. science, right? He, so he had, he had a lot of disagreements with Hannah Arndt, and they they, yes. they, they had some disagreements. <laughs> yeah, but right. his but his view on like history specifically was that history was this kind of um, sagacity you know it's based on the sagacity of the historian to kind of piece together these um disconnected you know events yeah. and and it was about the narrative that the historian weaves you know they were all were almost yeah. like an art yeah mm -hmm. whereas in mm -hmm. science what what they were doing was was finding the logical causal connections which existed in the world yeah um and then i i play that off against thomas kuhn's work so this idea of of science being about um scientific revolutions mm -hmm. and um 
and the kind of mechanisms that science has built in, you know, within it in order to cover up the fact that it's undergone these kind of revolutionary periods, right? So, so we see that there have been different theories which have dominated science at different times, but at every time science has presented itself as the answer, well, the kind of, well, let's say the, the, the total answer just to be kind of um, paradigmatic here, mm-hmm. to, to all the um, issues that, that we face in reality at the moment. You know, the, the idea that it could be false and replaced by another different theory is incomprehensible to science, right? Mm-hmm. But that shows how by viewing science through a historical lens, we now see it as a human activity, which is essentially trying to, you know, cover up its own historical origin in, in order to give itself a better objectivity, right? Um, but that wouldn't happen if it was just scientists doing science, yes? Yeah? So, mm-hmm. um, I, I think that idea of staying in your own lane has become less, would I say popular, I guess, in a way? Like, I think that, mm. that we, we now understand that science is engaging um, a lot of the time with very complex problems which involve social factors which involve um kind of well psychological issues you know so if we think about kind of um, healthcare responses stuff like that we realize that good science by itself isn't enough and um and, and good science is a bit of a kind of um caricature of what science is anyway right i mean it's you know this this idea of well, I don't want to come across as sounding, I'm not anti-science at all, but this idea of follow the science is something that gets used a lot now as the idea of I'm just following facts, yeah. But the idea is is that facts are also um, usually connected with certain values and dispositions which reflect people's own kind of um, views on something. So, yeah. so it's not yeah. to deny that there's, you know, greater and lesser levels of objectivity. Absolutely. Sure, of course. But, yeah. yeah, but the, it's, a, it's a, I think it's a very well-meaning but very, or slogan. Um, yes, yeah. You don't trust science. You test science. You you observe. You try to find more. You run experiments. It's not. Yeah. It's it's not a. It's not the eleventh commandment. And so exactly. I mean that's you know there's there's I, I I understand I think the 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 motive behind it, but I think it's a poor poor slogan. I don't know. I, as you were, if you're saying all this stuff, I I don't know. I mean I I agree with what you're saying. I I I I I have the the. I don't know, maybe the cynical part of me is, and the worried part of me is, is that I I see and I hear too many people that have a title after their name and that, and they think that it gives them this authority to speak on anything with authority. And, and I don't even think that's a temperament thing. I think that there's now. I think it's different with philosophy. I mean, philosophy is wonderful because it 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 does. I, I again, like I, I really do see philosophy and everything. But I think when you're like a specialist in something, so your training is in biology. Let's say, of course, you're going to be able to speak. I mean, hopefully, there's some you know epistemic humility of sorts of things you don't know, etc. But you know, that's that's a good good scientist should have that. But you know, I I don't want a biologist to tell me about you know, uh, exactly about, um, you know, engineering. Like I just, I mean, there's, there's some elements of it, but I mean, I don't know if they're going to be able to understand the ins and outs of fire engineering, you know, having a PhD in something, you know, I I have a, I have a a PhD in psychology, right. That does not, it makes me an expert quote unquote in, in, in human behavior and psychology, but that does not mean that I'm an expert in climate science. You know what I mean? Right. And I and I and I and I I think the I agree with what you're saying, but I feel like as with anything, there are bad faith actors or people that are are not the best that think that, you know, because you can read a a, a scientific paper in a journal that you can opine about anything because you know how to read some, yeah. you know, some stats or something. Uh, what do you? What I mean, I don't know. What do so, you think about this thing? So what about like um, biological explanations of morality then? I mean, because that's a interesting yeah. overlap of disciplines yeah. yeah yeah give me an example give me an example um so like um sociobiology was a movement in the 80s which thought that they mm-hmm. could explain all human behavior by reducing it to um you know genetic factors essentially right oh. um it got almost like refuted in philosophical circles you know within um five years i'd say you know philip kitcher had a fantastic book just showing why it made no sense but in psychology for instance i think it's been it's had a much longer life yeah i mean we now have a lot of kind of genetic psychology which is you know i mean it shows evidence um that there's certain aspects which um have found certain um like 
well, components, genetic components, which are associated with certain conditions, for instance. But, but I think this idea that, um, that morality, for instance, is reducible to biology, maybe mm-hmm. is to misunderstand what morality is, right? Um, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think that I, I, I find people that try to do that is, is just, just too parochial, right? I think that there's there's too much of, when you're dealing with something that's, that's uh, I mean, I have my own opinions about morals, but yes. I, I think I think even if you're going to play that game with morals, you can't do this reductionistic argument to have one kind of study to say, here's here's where it is grounded in biological fact or something like that. I think there's components of that, but I don't think that the totality of understanding morality is 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 attributed to that. That's that's like trying to that's like trying to make you know, morals, a a type of gravity. Well, we have the formula and here's all the things we know about. I mean, that's just not, I just don't, I just don't think that that's for things like that, you know, consciousness, love, um, maybe, maybe elements of faith, if you will, you you just, those are abstract ideas to, at least at this point that I don't, there is so many components, so many, so many disciplines that are there. I just don't think that stuff works. I will say just one thing with that. It's, it's definitely in 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 psychology and social psychology more specifically, but but psychology generally, and and I think sociology and other other uh, disciplines is I think people get really excited about an idea, and it has a lot of potential, and and then it becomes a trend, and it becomes a fad, and then it's it's gone, it's gone, it's gone, and you can't you can't you can't put it back in the box. And then it gets to the gurus and everyone that's teaching all the woo and the motivational speakers. And then it's, you know, and it, once it, once it gets out, it's, it's hard to put back in. And there, there are so many things in, in my field that are not replicable. So many things that are fine, but they're not the power that they think people think they have. And, and it, sure, and it, yeah. I think we see that not just in psychology, we see that in economics, we Absolutely. see that, we, we see that in a lot of places. And it's like, People like their ideas. They like how it makes them feel, and it's not that. And mm, yeah. you know, I think that that's, I think that's a big problem. I think we we need to have a healthy amount of skepticism for a long time before saying, you know, do you know what this does? And, and this is the power it has for that. It's like okay, we, we've done we've done you know three studies, you know, or we've done a couple studies over you know two years. Let's give it a decade. Let's give it yeah. at least five years. Um, and a lot of people just don't do that. But, but I think the the sense is, is that there's um the reason why sociobiology is so powerful is because it, it plays into um two of the kind of big issues that I that come up in the book a lot. And one is the unity of science and the other one is naturalism. Yeah. So so the idea that you can offer a unified explanation for for something to exist, you know, which is like it came from Huell, um, his conception of consilience. Mm-hmm. Um it, it's brought back up by E.O. Wilson, who is one of the kind of founders of sociobiology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And and it's not so. So if we were to compare that to what makes um, good science, yeah, you know, empirically based, you know, mm-hmm. kind of um, judgments based based on evidence, yeah, um, it seems that something like sociobiology doesn't fit that category, right? You know, there there isn't a lot of um, evidence to show that it's applicable across all cases, and um, to to say that it's kind of eradicating other disciplines in a sense you know kind of showing them to be irrelevant and showing them to be kind of a, a residual kind of humanities or, or arts based thing that we do mm-hmm. is um to to try and show that naturalism has a has a wider scope than it currently does as well right you know it can encroach in the domains of things that it's not currently encroaching on so mm-hmm. so i do think in, in that sense it's it's not just about the fact that it's not yet the case it's about the fact that even seeing it as being the case Mm. is to, to have a faith in it which is maybe not well founded from a kind of good scientific standpoint and to draw that back to another aspect of the book i mean so i i, I kind of focus on um discussions between say substance ontologists or people who think that there are universal laws you know covering all of nature all the time mm-hmm. and they basically say the reason we find it hard to detect these universal laws is because other laws are kind of colliding with them so so they all mm-hmm. seem a bit more um contextual and I can contrast that with Nancy Cartwright's work, which is more about this kind of um, this context-specific metaphysics. Yeah, mm. so it's the idea that you know 
if science is about these universal laws um, and we base it on something like Newtonian science, which is really important for Kant as well, you know, Kant basically based the whole of his philosophy on what Newton had discovered in terms of certainty. Um, but Cartwright's view is that like 99% of science has shown this not to be the case. Yeah, the kind of the, the universality and the consistency, which is found um, under kind of Newtonian mechanics, is almost never found in other kind of scientific discoveries, right? So, so if we were good scientists, we'd say that that's not the way the world is, right? You know, the, the world is context specific. It's messy. It's, um, you know, patchwork to use her phrase, right? So, mm -hmm. so yeah. But we're making yeah. metaphysical positions that you're making metaphysical judgments, right? So, <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the, I mean, that's the tricky part. I, I thought it was interesting what you were saying about the, about uh, this kind of turn or pivot to spiritualism of sorts that some, some, some naturalists do. Maybe I just had a conversation with Jim Costa about um, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. You know, he's a big Wallace Darwin uh, scholar. And he wrote this fabulous biography on Wallace, and he's he's great, and and he, you know he's, he's he's brilliant in so many ways. And somewhere towards the end of his life, or back half of his life, he had this turn towards spiritualism, which was I don't know. I mean, obviously these things are in context, you know, the time and stuff, but it it, it doesn't invalidate his work, but it does. It just it always feels like a like a weird unnecessary turn and and to your point of like why 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 do this why 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 do you need to do this are you is are you just you're just tired of the naturalism stuff and you want to you want to ask deeper questions and you turn to this or you can't find it in nature so you, I, I'm not quite sure I mean I, I forget all the particulars but you know he had some logical reasoning for his spiritualism i forget what brand it was but it, it it was it was weird but it wasn't illogical and it was it's interesting i guess i should say and, and a lot of people kind of were like no no that that can't be and and so but other people were like oh, maybe we just don't know it's still kind of a little wacky but i, I don't know i mean it's a, i'm sure you maybe you've heard a little bit about this I and mean, i'm sure there are others but w w i guess what do you what do you make of this um so i think that in the context of, of the work that I've been doing, it's, it's more about like, understanding the way the judgment impacts the way we do science, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I think that, so, so Kant would agree that um, biology has this certain kind of um, reverence about it, right? You know, he, his, his view would be when we're experiencing organisms, um, mm. they are, so, so say Kant's view of nature generally was that it's Newtonian, it's efficient causation, you know, cause comes before effect. Mm -hmm. Organisms require you to look at the world in a completely different way. Yeah? The parts exist for the sake of the whole. Um, the, uh, they, they reproduce, you know, they decay, um, they grow, right? These, these are things that under kind of, in Kant's time, that there was no explanation for how that happens under a Newtonian model, yeah. And and in his early work, um, he he explicitly thought that that was essentially evidence for the existence of God, yeah. And so another figure in this would be Paley, who was more influential on Darwin. Um, he had uh, a view that the organisms were like self-replicating machines, right? So he says you find a watch on a heath and then the watch reproduces itself. And he goes, that's basically, you know, organisms. Um, Kant and Paley totally disagree on this because you know, they never met, they never spoke, they never read each other's work. Um, um, but Kant doesn't think that organisms are like machines because they repair themselves, right? You know, they they reproduce, you know, no machine can do this at Kant's time, at least, and and still can't do this now, right? So that idea of having a, an internal self-organization or self-organizing principle is, is very different than being a machine, which is the product of intentions outside of yourself, right? Mm -hmm. But but Paley took this as kind of evidence of our divine creation, right, that God had created us. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that in biology generally, when you start viewing organisms as if they are machines, right? <laughs> you know, they start getting these kind of divine qualities. You go, oh, this is so well, you know, aligned. Yeah, isn't it beautiful? Um, and I think that what Kant does is he shows that those arguments are problem. That they're not that they don't work well. That they don't work. But but it's more that they uh, they 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 show us that there's this kind of um, structure that makes the experience of organisms and of the world quite kind of m mystical, you know, something that 
we're engaging in. If you think of after Kant, there was Goethe who was doing stuff, you know, kind of going out and looking at nature, like the metamorphosis of plants and going, isn't this beautiful? This is evidence of God, you know? And also like Spinoza in the background, you know, going on about, you know, God that is nature, this idea of desid natura. Um, there is this sense in which there's something very... Um, what spiritually awakening about engaging with nature yeah and, and i think that that does lead certain people who spend a long time working on nature and thinking about nature and kind of thinking about those parts of nature which are just completely like mystical um to, to lead well, leads them towards a more kind of um naturalist spiritualism something like that you know it's yeah, it's like it's like that it's like that feeling and i have a friend of mine who does research on this it's like that feeling we get of awe yeah. When you feel that when you feel awe, it feels bigger and beyond you, right? And and if you have enough things that are explained by science, let's say, or or good system, and then there's all of these gaps that don't. And that's not to say that these folks are doing a god of the gaps kind of thing, but that there's this like it it, it can't just be chance. It just can't be. It has to be. It must be something yeah. bigger. Absolutely. And the yes. and the reality is is that it it doesn't. It might not. Um, some people do think that, and I wonder. I, I guess my question: whether, whether people agree or disagree with that. I guess my question is: why the? For many humans, it's always it's always the, it's it's the jump to that. It's always right. the jump to that. We, 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 it's got to be bigger than us. There's no way that's by accident or by luck or something. Or even yeah. if we have great um, uh, 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 facts that we understand about life like you know natural selection and sexual selection and evolution and even still it's like yes but that can't be that you know it's yeah. only that it has to be something else why why do you think there's that kind of jump i mean i mean it's more so so from my perspective it's more that kant was with us in this idea that there is something that compels us to to think that there's something more right so uh so he ends the, the the third critique, which is the, the the book in which he writes about teleological judgment, um, you know, physical teleology, and he ends that book by by basically saying that in the first critique he had denied knowledge of the existence of God. Um, you know, he'd said that we can't know that God exists because in order to make a logical argument for the existence of God. God would already have to be kind of a physical entity, which would be kind of amenable to the laws of logic, basically. And, and we can't prove it a priori because um, it's just not possible to like conjure something into existence through a priori reasoning, right? You know, it says existence is not a predicate. Yeah, that's the, the kind of thing um, or, the, or the core argument in the first critique. In the third critique, he uses this more kind of ethical argument. And it's this idea that it nature is constructed in a way as if it looks like it was created by something which had intentional design but we can't know that that thing exists because you know the first critique tells us that we can't have knowledge of god right but then he, it does show us that um in in our ethical well-being we can kind of we can project ourselves as the purpose of nature and then try and create kind of morality on earth and that's basically how the third critique ends right and it's because he well, I would say it's because he understands that we are compelled to to kind of be drawn towards thinking that God exists through um, the existence of the judgment of biological organisms, right? So we don't want to say that they exist independent of us because um, you're a Kantian and you're saying it's his judgment. But then when you bring that back to biology and the way that biologists use Kant's philosophy, almost nobody who is talking about Kant in, in like philosophy of biology circles is talking about our ethical duty to ourselves in terms of the you know kind of final purpose of the world because that sounds mad right yeah but, but that is like where the argument goes right and almost no one in Kant scholarship is saying that either but that is where the argument goes you know they go mm. you know a lot of Kant scholars will go I don't want to talk about the God stuff I don't see it as important you know and uh and I don't think we can do that kind of authentically with Kant I think we do have to take him as a totality you know kind of transcendental idealism um this idea of the, the unity of reason for instance you know it, it requires us to take his philosophy kind of as a whole which is quite um unpopular in in contemporary kind of scholarship i would say you know we all specialize and we all silo and we become kind of moral philosophers or epistemologists or metaphysicians and then we just refuse to read outside of our disciplines right and and that's not really what i see as the um 
the, the kind of spirit of Kant's work. Yeah, he's trying to be a polymath. He's trying to tie it all together. You know, he's got the kind of um, the epistemology, the metaphysics, the morality, the teleology, you know, beauty, politics as well. You know, he tries to kind of piece together as much as possible. And I would say there is a thread through that, whereas, you know, that, that might be a bit controversial. But. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, I it's a it's a to me it's an open question about why people make that 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 turn it's it's it is it's it's a good question yeah it's a very very good question maybe the the question is whether should we should we kind of hold them accountable to the reasons why they make that turn right so so i think as a as someone who's inspired by like more or more interested in kant i would say that there's there's good reasons why we might say you've not made that turn for reasons that um, kind of follow from one another, yeah? So the idea of a, a feeling of beauty towards, you know, um, what you would claim to be knowledge of the existence of something greater than yourself, um, I don't know whether that really meets, you know, we, we've got to ask, what are the conditions of knowledge in that, right? So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I work with people who who work with psychedelics as well, and then they have this this idea that you can kind of, you know, get spiritual awakenings through certain psychedelic substances. And I think, like, from a from a Kantian perspective, and I think it's, you know, the other thing important here is that he's, he's kind of coming from a Protestant background, yeah, is the idea that you have to kind of work hard to to figure out what you know, and, and that idea of, you know, bypassing all that and just going straight to psychedelics is, is kind of a cheap way to, to get mm-hmm. knowledge of the existence of god right so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember I, i've had i've had i've had two two conversations about this turn and, and maybe it's my own background or whatever but um <clears throat> when i talked to ben norris about uh we, we talked about spinoza and we, we german idealism yeah, yeah. uh you know, broadly but we talked about shelling and yeah, yeah. Schelling is great. His his philosophy of nature or whatever is 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 really fascinating, really fascinating. And and I did not I don't know a lot about Schelling and um and you know Ben was telling me that you know uh there's this whole like late Schelling and I was like, "Okay, what's this about?" And he tells me it's like uber religious. Yeah. And it was so frustrating because it was like you don't need to make that turn. Like it doesn't, it's not commiserate with anything else. It's not necessary. I feel the same way uh, about Kierkegaard. Now, Kierkegaard could give a little bit more of a pass because uh, I know he was, I mean, legitimately pretty religious. And but on on the full, it's like your philosophical ideas are great, actually. Um, I just don't. I always read the religious parts when I'm like, I this doesn't. I don't think this is doing what you think it does. Like you could have all of the, I could read everything you just explained without that. And it works. And I'd never get outside of maybe like personally or politically or culturally doing that. It it doesn't on the arguments themselves. It doesn't really, it's not necessary. It's where I see those are just two examples that come to mind. I'm not sure if it, I mean, like, Hans Jonas is another figure who comes up in this kind of self-organization stuff a lot. And, you know, Gnosticism is his background. So uh, um, I'm not sure whether it is necessary. I mean, maybe for the people who are experiencing it, it is a necessary turn, right? I mean, like, so, yeah, I, I was, so, so I, in, in uh, University of the West of England, when I was doing my undergraduate and master's degrees, I was taught by um, Ian Hamilton Grant, who is a kind of big Schillingian. Um, oh, wow. And yeah, like super interesting. You know, I was, I was properly taken away by by the kind of ontology of Hegel, of Schelling, of Fichte. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But but then when I started teaching Kant again, I went, this is, this feels like it has more kind of, um, I liked the way it was compartmentalized. I liked the way that mm-hmm. the metaphysics had boundaries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I always found it hard to like, like, so, so I did early Hegel and early Fichte and early Schelling. It's all the identity philosophy stuff. And, you know, you get it, but you go, these are just nice words, which, you know, kind of are supposed to relate to essences and substances, which are beyond us. And I just never quite made the jump. But maybe that is why I don't make the spiritual jump as well, because I didn't make the metaphysical one. Yeah. I mean, the metaphysical jump seems as weird to me as the spiritual jump. Yeah. I could, yeah, I could, I could definitely see that. I don't, oh, again, it's an open question. So, it's, absolutely, <laughs> it's, over, yeah. it's, over, it's, it's an interesting one um and maybe i just need more time with it or something but as of right now i'm like i, I don't see it. all the other ideas are fine but maybe, maybe that's just my bias yes <laughs> well, <laughs> <I don't. laughs> um okay so let's talk about uh lenore if I, uh, yeah, thesis yeah, lenore, yeah. 
yeah. and, uh, and and some of the controversy with his uh, his thesis. You talk about it a little bit in the book, okay. so so yeah, uh, lay it out so, first. So, yeah, so I'll, I'll tell you why I talk about it. So, so I talk about it because it's it's outlining the way that Kant was influential in Germany, right? So so there is this. My book is about kind of tracing a much more um, United Kingdom like Britain type focus on on, on Kant's influence, um, primarily because it hadn't been done before, but also. I didn't want to replicate the work which had already been done, you know, so I wanted to learn from it. Mm -hmm. And um, Benoit had come up with this idea that he was, um, that Kant was influential for this um, movement, which was basically called teleomechanism. Mm -hmm. And it was one which was very naturalist, right? So it saw the organism as, um, as kind of essentially irreducible to biology. And it was taken up by um, Blumenbach, who was a contemporary of Kant. And and they claimed that they, you know, kind of agreed with one another. But there was this big disagreement because Kant was essentially saying that um, that organisms are a product of judgment. And Blumenbach was saying organisms are a force kind of of the same kind as a Newtonian force, but different, obviously. Yeah. So, mm. so the idea was that he saw um, organic forces as comparable to um, physical forces. And that moved through a whole um, kind of group of individuals in um, Germany, including people like Kilmeyer, and, and they were all kind of, you know, coming up with this idea that um, what was irreducible was the fact that organisms possess this this ability for kind of um, reproduction, um, growth, and their parts exist for the sake of the whole, which is not, you know, which is different than the rest of nature. So, mm. so it's this idea that you know this biology as a special science only came about because of Kant, yeah, mm. but then. I use it in the book because I think that Lenoir does not focus on those problems, you know, those incompatibilities in Afia. So he basically admits that they're there, you know, he admits that there's there's no kind of um, kind of overall compatibility with transcendental idealism and this teleomechanist program. But he doesn't really go into why that's a problem in the same way that Zemito does, right? Because Zemito basically just tries to shut down the whole idea, you know, the whole theory. And, and my point is that if we expand the notion of influence to include these misunderstandings, then we get a much richer account of how these ideas kind of develop, you know, so kind of a history of idea type approach. Mm. And, and in that first chapter of the book, it's more about kind of outlining how, how Kant was um, influential on biology, but then also biologists misunderstood Kant here. Yeah. So, and, and I trace this back to the idea that the noir has this, um, this kind of heavy reliance on um, Lakatosh's conception of um, research programs, which have hardcore, softcore elements. And, and that means that kind of the, the most kind of essential features of a scientific research program are not um, kind of subject to scrutiny. You know, we kind of direct all our research towards these, what, what um, Lakatosh calls auxiliary hypothesis, and they could be replaced and kind of, you know, kind of shown to be wrong without the whole theory being shown to be wrong. But if we were to say organisms don't self-organize or something like that, or or what does the world look like if there's not the kind of real self-organization, um, then that could destroy the whole kind of theory. And it's just not in you know any research program's interest to kind of destroy itself. So yeah. so so that I use it to open up that conception of misunderstanding, which runs through the other chapters of the book. You know, so every chapter is basically there's an influence here, or well, for the first three chapters at least, there's an influence here, but there's also a misunderstanding. And that misunderstanding is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Again, not that there's. I think you 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 said it in the beginning. You you talked about um, uh, you know, there's not the you know codified way to 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 read Kant necessarily, but there are misunderstandings, and sometimes those can have serious implications if you're building off of his thought or or just in general his his ideas he espouses off a of misunderstanding. So it's great how you open that up in the book, but what do we do with that? Or how do we how do we how do we understand the, the ideas that arise from it? I mean, misunderstandings aren't bad, right? That's the first thing. I mean, I think it's I think the idea of having understanding as the benchmark for influence is um, just to completely miss the point of how information is communicated generally, right? You know, I mean, most of my job is about trying to identify these misunderstandings and iron them out. You know, I would say. More, more so than not, people are misunderstood. Yeah, like just, just in general, right? So, so the idea that people just read off people's theories um, with complete accuracy is is to raise the the benchmark for influence way too high. You know, in terms of actually figuring out what's happened in a particular situation. Um, I think that we can understand what's what's implicated in certain concepts. Yeah, so I think that. We've had a few, well, we've talked a bit about how, you know, the differences between disciplines that kind of 
science and philosophy are these um, very different domains and they don't have much um, or that at some points they don't have much overlap. I mean, I would suggest that the way that language is used, and this may not be a philosophical thing, it could be like a linguistic thing as well, is is always um, opening up the opportunity for like people to be articulating certain things about what they do in ways that don't correspond with, say, their their evidence, for instance. So like in in, um, in science, for instance, there's a lot of metaphors, like, you know, waves, particles, you know, wherever you look, really, there's some kind of metaphorical use of language. Um, and that feels like it has, on the one side, it has a certain kind of um, basic understanding on the sense of the scientists who use it, like it's just accepted the way that it is. Um, they don't ask those really deep philosophical questions. But there is another sense in which when a philosopher comes to these disciplines and goes, but why do you call it that? You know, it's not really that, you know, that doesn't actually represent what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a sense in which, you know, there's there's philosophically important questions to be asked by the basic presuppositions of what science is doing. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's why misunderstanding is, is important, I guess, you know, but, mm -hmm. but it's something... In the past, people have, when I've spoken about this, they thought it's very kind of negative. Yeah, they go, so how do we get rid of these misunderstandings? And and from a like historical perspective, we're not trying to get rid of them. You know, we're just trying to identify them and then show what the consequence of them is. Mm. Mm. That's a nice. That's a nice framing. Well, what about the misunderstandings then that Kant had on Hume's thought? You talk yeah, about yeah. this a lot on ideas and matters of fact, and you know how Kant separated the objects and themselves from experiences of the objects, which is really yeah. interesting for me. So yeah, just talk about the misunderstanding okay. there. Yeah, so so Hume is, I would I would classify Hume as quite a straightforward philosopher, right? You know, he's he's a naturalist, um, broadly speaking, um, and. His his main contribution was in, in terms of philosophy was that um, he had this distinction between relations of ideas and matters of fact. So, and it's not just Kant's misunderstanding. I think we generally learn Hume this way: is that relations of ideas are logical truths that exist independent of experience, and matters of fact um, refer to all causal claims that we make. Yeah. So, so Hume claimed that with with matters of fact, the problem is is that we can never know them to be certain yeah so 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 we can never know with like rational argument that they're always going to remain the same so the you know this famous quote is that the um the idea that the sun will never will not rise tomorrow is no less contradictory than it's opposite yeah that it will um but kant was annoyed well he's say he's annoyed i mean his disagreement with hume was that he thought that hume hadn't subjected relations of ideas to the kind of skepticism that matters of fact had been subjected to so kant thought that hume had never thought that um like mathematical truths or geometrical truths were were kind of um, open to this kind of skeptical argument. So my approach in the book is to show that Hume actually did um, subject them to the skepticism, but it was more that something like a mathematical, like two plus two is four, mathematical equation, it it's true by kind of the demonstration of the act of, of doing the sum. Yeah? You don't need to do it again afterwards, yeah. And, and there's certain parts of Hume where he kind of compares it to other things and, and he shows that kind of mathematics has to have a certain kind of demonstration, whereas um, other things like property law are, are true by kind of the, the, the construction of like rhetoric alone, yeah. So, um, so, so that kind of shows that there is this aspect of Hume where he is showing that um, you know mathematical truths still require a certain kind of demonstration, or, but it's that that demonstration actually proves their certainty in all possible cases. Whereas matters of fact, you know, it seems pretty clear that that you know it is true that um, we can't observe the causal connections between our experiences. Yeah. So what Kant does with that is um, he. He agrees with Hume on the kind of matters of fact side, yeah. But he thinks, well, my my kind of interpretation of Kant would say that he thinks that that's not just about the causal connection of objects independent of experience, which is what Hume makes it about, mm. but it's about the objects themselves, right? So, mm. Mm. so we need to bring the representation of the objects into experience and causality into the domain of experience, and then show that it's not so for Hume. The, the causal connection, the, the rational causal connection is replaced by habit or custom, mm. which seems very non, you know, it seems like something that a skeptic wouldn't do, right? To have this really strong belief in habit or custom for, mm -hmm. for causality. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that's exactly well how I read Hume, and I think how Kant read Hume is this idea that you know by by saying that it's just a custom or a habit of that we do. Um, Hume is basically saying, well, we have no rational reason why this is the case, but we just do it because we couldn't possibly do otherwise. And what Kant does is he kind of brings that into the uh, but the, the sphere of experience and and shows that causality is a concept that we apply to objects within experience rather than something that we try and like establish for for objects in themselves. Mm. Is that because Hume wasn't sure how we got to things? So he said, well, we, we obviously do it. And, 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 and he doesn't want to just do the representational kind of uh, turn, but he wants to say like, well, it must be a, a ritual or a habit or a pattern or whatever. And it is, but we you know, can't know, know all of the things why, whereas Kant was saying, no, 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 no. Uh, it's it's what is that experience of the object, not the actual entities itself? Is it something like that, or, or we don't know? Well, I don't think Hume ever really made the distinction between the object as it's experienced and the object in itself. Mm. He really only focused on the causal connection between objects as the thing that we need to kind of mm -hmm. be skeptical about in terms of our reason. Whereas, mm. whereas Kant thinks that by making that distinction, that it kind of changes the whole relationship, right? So. So, 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 so th that was my next kind of question here is why does that matter? I guess, right? So people will say like, oh yeah, this you know, philosophers arguing, you know, in the weeds yeah, and yeah. stuff. And it's like, no, no, no. I mean, it's, it's very interesting, but I guess that has implications, right? That has serious implications, uh, tangibly. I don't know if you can give an example or whatever, but I mean, how, how, what is the like kind of practical implication of, of, of viewing the world philosophically or in that way, if you view it in the way Hume views it, what, what we we might see. And if you view it in the way that, that Kant is seeing it, what what might we see? Well, Hume, so on my reading, it's all interpretation, right? But, but Hume no, says it's that, all interpretation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but Hume says that it's not rational, right? Hume says that our use of causality in everyday experience is not rational. That we can give no rational explanation for it. Whereas by, by showing that objects only exist within the domain of experience, you know, Kant isn't concerned about that um, causal relationship between objects and themselves, which he would agree is not rational in Hume's terms. But then he's like, but reason only has applicability within experience, right? Or at least in terms of um, theoretical reason. Yeah. So, so what we can do then is we can start um, explaining why causality is a concept rather than like something that we are applying outside of experience. Mm -hmm. um, and what causality is for Kant is... Basically, you know, he thinks that space and time are produced by the subject, but then causality is the ordering of time within experience. Yeah. So if something has a necessary time order, Kant sees that as causal. Yeah. So, so in the in the second analogy and the first critique, he goes on about kind of viewing houses and ships going downstream. I mean, they're really weird examples. So I'm still, you know, I mean, they don't seem causal in a way, yeah. But he's like, the ship, that's causal because it's going downstream, you know, and the and um, if you can view the house, you can view it in different ways. And that's not causal because there's no kind of necessary time order. Yeah? Um, and, and then he starts talking about balls on pillows and he goes, well, that's also causal. Even though there's not a you know, time order, there's a kind of there's an ordering of time, but not a lapse in time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, but he, what he's trying to do is he's trying to show that there's 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 a kind of um, rational application of causality within experience, and then from that we can start making inferences about um, science. You know the way that we we structure our concepts in terms of making um, hierarchical um, kind of systems. Yeah, and that's just not possible in Hume's account because he's just said that all we have is experience, and we can't give any rational explanation as to why we think things are causal in the first place. Yeah. Mm. It's, it's very interesting the, the, the explanations for it, uh, and and you know I <clears throat> I don't um, as is probably true for a lot of people I guess uh, I was always taken by the phenomenologists, but I won't bring them in here because that's much later <laughs> and it makes things more complicated. But uh, experience <laughs> is interesting though. Um, okay, so so I guess the 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 one thing here we can we can jump to is. Um, Let's go to uh, Wheel Wheelwell. Is that how you say um, it? Hugh. So it's like a, yeah. Oh, Hugh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. W yeah. What? Uh, what? Um, what was his, Kant's major influence on on Hugh's thinking and right. the disagreements and and then you can kind of bring in yeah. theology again somewhere in there. But uh, yeah, what, what was that yeah, influence? Yeah. So um, it's more about kind of so so there's disagreement about the extent to which Kant influenced Huel, right? This is why, again, I'm, I'm kind of drawn by the debates which currently exist, yeah, so... so In terms of debates yeah. of whether it was 
a heavy amount of influence or not at all? That not kind of at all, right? Yeah, that uh -huh. kind of really polarized. So some people, so for okay. instance, um, Robert Butts has a has an article where he calls Huel a kind of Kantian prodigy, right? Um, you know, he couldn't be any more Kantian if he tried. But um, like like Fish, for instance, there's, a, there's another scholar called Fish, and his his view is that there's no like mention of Kantian terminology, like intuitions, concepts, um, you know, schematism, all that stuff that you'd find in like central to Kant, it's not in Huel at all. So, so they go, how could he possibly have influenced him at all? Yeah. So, um, it seems that the, the, the kind of scholarship falls, it weights towards there is some kind of influence. Yeah. Just given the, the kind of issues that they deal with, um, and, and the way their philosophies are structured, it seems that there is something there. Um, I'm taken by the idea that in Huel you have the active powers of the mind. That's the first thing, which I think he takes from Kant. Um, the, the second thing is that he makes a separation between um, what he calls thoughts and things, right? So there's this idea that knowledge is created from two distinct sources. For Kant, it's intuitions, concepts. Mm. For Huel, it's thoughts and things. And um, the third thing is the role of unity, right? So, so the unity of... Um, well, reason for Kant, and then what Huel comes up with is consilience, right? So, and consilience becomes a really important driver in the way that science is understood. Um, so, I mean, to give you a context of of Huel in general, I mean, he was he didn't write a lot. Um, well, he did write a lot, but but he didn't write like stuff that we um, that we would kind of recognize today. For instance, you know, so say like Darwin is a massive figure in today's society, right? Yeah. But Huel was really important in how science was evolving, right? So he came up with terms like cathode and anode, and he he wrote books on um, how inductive science should be done, um, on the relationship between kind of religion and science. Um, and in that sense, he was he was a significant figure in Cambridge in kind of shaping scientific methodology. Mm. So, so, so that's where like the similarities are the differences are is that he wasn't happy with the idea that um our knowledge was limited well this this would be my argument is that he wasn't happy with the idea that knowledge is limited to the human subject you know the human condition mm. so he all has these like strange throwaway lines in his text where it goes you know a priori reasoning well a, a posteriori reasoning becomes a priori over time for instance you know so if we and, and that's kind of completely anti-human right the idea is, is that if it happens enough then it's just a priori um but that that seems like a, a very strange kind of shift in, in in kind of um how philosophy is usually done how those distinctions are usually made um and, and he also has this idea that Consilience is so consilience is this term where you have a set of facts and they support a theory. And then if you can establish that that theory can also apply to other facts, you know, of, of other disciplines essentially. So that idea of um, you know, kind of expansion within your um your scientific theory, then that's a indication that that theory is true, right? And this is what consilience is. It's this kind of universalizing um, scope or increasing scope of scientific theories. And then when he's asked, well, how do we know that that's right? You know, couldn't there possibly be theories which are wrong? And at the time which he's writing, he goes, nope, it's never been shown that historically any theory which does this could later be proven wrong. And then when people kind of push him further, you know, they go, but, but seriously, you know, you can't just have history as a, as a kind of justification for this being like a universal truth. Um, that's when he starts bringing in this kind of um, theological aspect, you know. So he starts talking about how, um, how kind of we are, in terms of our knowledge, we're standing on the shores of the sea of God's knowledge, and uh, and it's kind of God who is guiding us to to try and kind of um, expand our scientific horizon in that sense. Um, and and I argue that 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 aspect of Hume's philosophy is is kind of, it's a um, response to the limitation that Kant puts on science, yeah. So that idea that, you know, Kantian philosophy of science looks like, oh, it's just about us, yeah. You know, it's just about kind of what we can know and what reason demands of us, but it's not really about the way the world is. I think that Huel wants a science which is much more world-oriented, but then realizes that if it's not just about our capacity for reason, it has to be about capacity for reason outside of ourselves, yeah. Hmm. So... His ideas, like consilience, for instance, became very important and have continued to be important for the way that we understand science, right? Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about naturalism again, we've got this sense in which a lot of the ideas of science that we hold to be quite central um, have come from this very like religiously oriented view of science, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, one which saw kind of 
religion and science as not kind of antipodal as we do now, you know, that the idea is to follow science, not follow religion. It was quite the opposite. Yeah, it was that in discovering things about nature, we are discovering, the, you know, the kind of book of God, you know, to, to bring the phrase of my previous project. Yeah. Is that where he's making these appeals to theology? Is it this kind of linkage here? Um, in this context, yeah, it's, it's all about discovery. Um, it's all about kind of, it's also about, he has this problem between thoughts and things, right? So so thoughts and things as the basis of knowledge don't really, aren't compatible with one another in the same way that intuitions and concepts in Kant aren't compatible with one another, yeah? And, and the way that Kant resolves this is he comes up with this um, faculty or which he calls the schematism right in the first critique it's bizarre even he says it's bizarre yeah he goes oh so it's hidden in the in the depths of the human soul is in the explanation <laughs> so it's this sense that Kant says that it's something that has to happen in order for for concepts and intuitions to kind of form an experience but we can't explain how it happens because it's in some way kind of pre-experience right mm -hmm. whereas for for Huell he um he thinks that it's resolved by this kind of appeal to God. He calls it a theological resolution of thoughts and things. And it's the idea that although we can't see how to unify these two things, you know, they are unified in God, basically. So, so yeah, um, that's one of the aspects of theology. And then the other aspect is that it's it's about kind of um, new scientific discoveries. You know, it definitely plays a supporting role in addition to the appeal to history, right? Which is the other mm -hmm. thing that he does. How much did, I guess, his, I mean, again, you're right, he's not well known. I mean, how much of that, his linking that he's making there and just at the time, maybe he was, he was more well-known, but he, through time, he hasn't been, Did he just get lost to time or those ideas just outdated. Where, where, where does he fall? I guess in our, um, I guess, history of science, I guess. I mean, I think consilience has remained to be an important aspect of science. I think maybe he was just more interested in um, framing the way that science ought to be done rather than doing his own science. Um, he was important in doing some work on um, like um, the tides, things like that. But but he was he was writing at a time when it, they were trying to, so sort of big scientists at the time were trying to talk about how science could get funded long term, right? Mm. Um, and in that sense, there's not a lot of, or there's not, you know, science as it exists today was very different from then. Yeah. So for instance, you know, Darwin um, made most of his discoveries on like the Beagle voyage, which was, you know, kind of a, another um, kind of project that was going on, you know, it's a Navy thing. And, um, and it wasn't something that was funded just primarily for the sake of the, the, the scientific um, advancements that it would make, but it was something that it was done on the back of another exhibition essentially. Yeah. So, so, so there's a sense in which, the way we do well, the way we science was subsequently done, and the way science was done then is 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 very kind of different. Mm. Um, mm. I don't think that his theological, well, if the question is, did his kind of theological stance somehow make him less recognised? I think it's more the case that to be a scientist at that time was probably to to view the world as um, a kind of a theologically what. Um, embedded inspired something like that you know i mean yeah. I, i'm yeah, not convinced yeah. of these atheist arguments of, of darwin either right so yeah 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 no i think that's true of of the time there was a a, a heavy cultural at least component of yeah. of religion or protestantism um it really hasn't been till you know, I mean, probably the 20th century and then progressively every decade that we're more and more secular you know for better for worse <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so 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 yeah I, I i definitely take that point so i guess you, you bring up darwin which is what i wanted to ask is how much was uh Hill's impact on 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 darwin uh specifically with the common ancestry and, and natural selection right yeah. and um and his ideas of biology pulled from kant's you know teleological judgments yeah i mean so i mean the the kind of really broad answer to that is that the the, the biological understanding, I argue, um, kind of falls away here. The, the Kant was not that relevant on Darwin in terms of his um, mm. biological work, right? Mm. I mean, what was relevant was this, this um, kind of, this movement from a, an account of science that was based on reason in Kant, and then it moves into a kind of um, theological orientation in Jewel. And then that idea of consilience becomes really important for Darwin justifying the uh, his account of common ancestry, right? So 
common ancestry is the idea that um, you know we we have these common ancestors and we 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 just you know which we can identify by looking back through our lineage, right? And unlike natural selection, which looks for similarities in traits, um, common ancestry looks for um, these vestiges, right? These these traits that we no longer use, but we have some kind of residual um, like evidence for them, right? So mm-hmm. so gills in um, in fetuses and and um, tail bones, stuff like that. Yeah, they're they're the things that basically, because they have no function anymore, the only way we can explain their appearance, you know, their kind of um, physiological appearance, is by saying that we must share a common ancestor with with um, with animals which still have that, basically, right? So so this allowed. Um, Darwin to to show that we were connected to um, species which were very different to ourselves. Yeah, so that idea of like the the, the theoretical um, kind of spread became you know which consilience demands became part of Darwin's theory. Yeah, so so the idea that he was kind of combining physiology with embryology, for instance, yeah, was was a big factor in, in Darwin showing that his theory was like. Well, in, in terms of the reception of Darwin's theory, it was very important. Yeah? He was trying to convince people that, that it was um, correct. Um, um, natural selection on the other side, it was you know, a different kind of argument because it's, it's trying to show that we are related. Well, well, it's trying to show that we are adapted to certain environments, right? So, so, so it's not trying to combine necessarily these, these other disciplines anymore, but it's showing that adaption um, entails survivability, either through um, natural selection or sexual selection. Mm-hmm. And, and that was seen as less of a kind of Huellian influence in a sense. I mean, the other person here is John Herschel, who had a different conception of these um, kind of justifications for science. And, and in terms of the, the literature, it seems that that's more of a Herschelian argument rather than a um, Huellian argument, right? So, mm-hmm. So yeah, so that's in a nutshell how Huell was really important for for Darwin, um, mm. and he kind of uses that. I mean, at some points in the in the um, in the origin, he says, you know, even if there was some evidence against it, you know, the mm. fact that it fulfills this um, kind of consilience type paradigm of science shows that it's true, right? So, yeah. how <clears throat> how does uh, Hunt's uh, account of the tele- teleological judgment? Uh, not work with Darwin's account of design. Uh, what is the, yeah. the, the the biggest interaction there? Um, so it really is complicated. That's the, so I think that if we if we view the traditional story of Darwin, that he was influenced by Paley and he saw organisms as machines, right? Mm-hmm. Essentially, um, but machines which have these special qualities which make them very non-machine like, but they're machines nonetheless, right? Um, mm-hmm. It's, so, so Michael Ruse has this view of Darwin, right? That it's about industry, it's about industrialization, it's about you know these kind of um, wheezing looms type things, and, uh, and and that's what organisms are analogous to um, mm. for for Ruse at least. Um, and in that sense, you know, Kant is talking about um, how organisms have these very specific features, you know, like teleology, and uh, well, they're 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 kind of. Well, like I've said before, you know, their parts exist for the sake of their whole. Um, they 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 grow, repair, reproduce, you know, all those things. Kant says that's why they're not like uh, machines at all, right? But then when Ruse is writing about um, Darwin, he has a whole chapter on Kant, which is odd, as a way of understanding Darwin because of the metaphorical use of, um, well, of um, final causes, essentially, yeah? So a big problem in biology is what are final causes? How do we understand them? And a lot of biologists go, well, we just use them as shorthand for, you know, things which are, you know, we use functions as shorthand for things that we know are much more complicated, but it just makes them, you know, understandable for us, yeah. Um, So in that sense, you know, Ruse appeals to Kant and kind of really confuses some of the core aspects of Kant's account of organisms in order to try and show why we can use um, a conception of organisms in Darwin as a kind of metaphorical frame. but it seems that there are these broader incompatibilities in the sense that Kant wasn't, well, I mean, like literally Kant wasn't interested in um, selection, for instance. Um, he had this view of, he was concerned about the existence of purposes, right? So so on the one side, we had, uh, he has a conception of relative purposes. So that's that's a purpose which exists for the sake of something else, yeah? So, for instance, we use like, well, in his time, we use oxes to plow fields. 
he also talks about how we kind of adorn ourselves with feathers from birds and stuff and and that all shows a relative purpose you know we're using something else for our own kind of selfish ends but that doesn't show that we necessarily have to exist which is what he's interested in showing yeah and that's an absolute purpose right Mm -hmm. so when he's talking about purposes he's talking about it in terms of this kind of distinction between relative and absolute purposes and the purposiveness of nature in general and he's showing that we can't show how like nature overall um has this purposive structure Mm. whereas darwin is trying to use it in a way that shows that organisms adapt right so there may be a reading of darwin which also has this kind of um kind of broader purposive goal oriented like cosmos yeah um and, and there are some interpreters who take it that way and say that because you know darwin has views like nature selects for, for for the good of the species you know whereas we select for kind of our own kind of selfish ends as well in that sense um there's this sense in which there is like a cosmic selection which is um kind of benevolent within darwin's account which shows that he's actually quite religious mm. and probably more religious than what a kantian account could offer mm. but but it does show that there's significant differences in the way that they understand final causes it's interesting when we see I always find it really interesting how we see big thinkers uh at one period influence big thinkers in another period or that they don't at all. And so it's interesting people have done this with, you know, how much was, you know, Nietzsche influenced by by uh by Darwin and or Freud and and here Darwin being influenced, you know, or not by Kant or other folks. It's just very interesting to see what's what's in their head. I mean, for, I mean we're talking big thinkers that have been <clears throat> tremendous for, for for different types of thinking um so i guess curious here then is what, what do we think kant's thoughts were on an organism or in another way how does his philosophy help us understand biological understandings of an organism right yeah so um his his conception of organisms is that they don't seem to be like other t- types of entities that would be compatible with a newtonian framework yeah so so he thinks that um, organisms possess these qualities that can only be explained as a product of judgment. Um, and he's kind of on the fence about whether it ever would be possible to reduce our understanding of organisms to a non um, kind of teleological conception of nature yeah which is which is where these um physicalist interpretations come in yeah that kind of what what Kant is really interested in is eradicating biology and judgment from like our conception of science because it's not proper science yeah so so Kant actually denies that biology could become a proper science yeah he has this um this this phrase in the third critique where he says it's impossible that we could hope for um you know a newton of the grass blade basically yeah so so this is what makes it so interesting that he he um well that he's so influential on biology given that he you know he literally you know explicitly denies the existence of biology as a science right um i think that in terms of how we can understand how that applies to biology today i mean i give the interpretation that i think that kant would would not would not account well he, his account would deny a lot of science the status of science yeah his idea of science is that it has to be universal has to be apodictically certain you know and he sees newton as achieving this and he hopes mm. that the rest of science will you know he's kind of on the fence about chemistry and the metaphysical foundations of natural science he says it's not science in um in um, a later text in opus posthumum or something like that he's kind of more more happy with it being a science right so <laughs> um so i think that he had this sense or this, um, not, well, it was kind of, he had this standard which science had to achieve in order to become proper science, which was so high that um, that now I think that even physics probably wouldn't properly reach it for him, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So yeah. if we start from that point, you know, we're like, well, what can Kant offer science today? Um, I think we have to get rid of those, like, really odd commitments that Kant has towards, like, holding science to such a high standard, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and And then we can say something like, you know those those problem cases of organisms that I spoke about. So say the the, the squids and the um, mm-hmm. you know and, and the pando forest, and also yeah. like I talk about termite mounds in the book as well. So in the termite mounds, the, the mound itself, which isn't like biotic at all, becomes selected for in terms of like a lung for harvesting fungi on the on the point of the termites. But those cases show that um, there are certain judgments that are made about what counts as science 
yeah, or what counts as a biological entity, which is of the interest of science. Um, and we need to think about how those judgments um, play a role in constituting our understanding of biology, right? So, so I would argue that there is a sp- if there is a space for Kant in, in biology, it's one which is about um, recognizing the, the human-centered um, nature of biology in terms of our selection of what counts as a biological organism to begin with, yeah. So another example would be um, something like immunology, right, where we, the, the self, something else I've worked on in the past, the self-metaphor in immunology, um, it was really important for immunology up until about uh, 20, 30 years ago. We started talking about it as a metaphor rather than a literal thing. Um and now we have these mechanistic explanations of biological mechanisms, but the mechanisms themselves don't really show us where the boundaries of organisms are, right? That's the, you know, so in immunology, you can tell that kind of you live with a cat or a dog and it becomes part of your immune system. But there's there's some judgment about whether that cat or dog is actually part of your like collective household immunity or something like that. Yeah. So, I mean, Derrida talks about kind of immune identity in a kind of national way and all of that. And it's it's more that, you know, in philosophy, we can we can play with these concepts in different ways than they can in science, yeah? And and showing that um, judgment does play a role in the way that we frame the world um, isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? You know, I I don't think it makes us anti-naturalists, which is what I get accused of a lot. I think it makes us understand that the generation of knowledge requires certain decisions to be made on our part about what counts as something which is relevant, right? How... How then do we, um, I guess if, it, if you know, you, you say the book is a, a Kant-inspired philosophy of science, which I thought was interesting, how can we use, like, this is just a kind of more, you know, general final question, but how can we use more philosophy in the physical and social sciences? How can we use more of it? I mean, we, there's some, like I said earlier, there's some push towards some of that, but how can we get more of that there or or or, or, or espouse a need for it and, and show its utility in, in the physical and social sciences? So the reason I call it a Kant-inspired approach is because I am, at that very last point of the book, I really am saying that we need to be dropping certain aspects of Kant's philosophy. This, you know, if, if we're going to have a productive conversation with science, um, and you know, my, my interpretation would be that if we followed the letter of Kant you know, to its nth degree, then we just have to deny that science ever you know, kind of consistently reached the standard that Kant um, kind of demanded of it basically but that's not helpful for our kind of conversation between you know how Kant is used in biology how Kant is used in other sciences and um, and what would be the the value of um, appealing back to his work today so I think that what we do get from Kant is we get well from the way that I use Kant at least is we get this um this kind of Perception of one of the last polymaths, yeah. Perception of someone who was really interested in, you know, all domains of like human experience, right? So, so he's got, you know, like I've said, epistemology and beauty and politics. Um, You know, if you want to read something about how Kant, you know, thought universities work, for instance, like the conflict of the faculties is really interesting essay about kind of the logistics of how to run different departments and how you know disciplines kind of work together and stuff like that. Um, But that shows that. Behind Kant's kind of strong universalistic demand in his science is a very is an interest in kind of the role of values, um, the role of how things fit together, the role of how different kind of disciplines can um, complement one another. And I think that we've got to a point in science now where it's not controversial to say that values are important in the development of science, but it is controversial to say what values are important, right? So, so I do think that you know we can say that. So, for instance, in the book, I say it's one aspect of Kant's political philosophy is that it shows how um, the decisions we make in politics should benefit citizens of certain countries, right, or of the countries that they're part of, yes, yeah, so nation states. Um, and I don't think it's a long kind of jump to say that we could extend those benefits to say that science should be, you know, kind of following those same kind of agreed benefits that are good for society, and one of the roles of science would be to try and figure out what they could be doing to make the world better for the citizens they are kind of supposed to be protecting, right? Mm. But, and it's not to say that's not a difficult question in principle, because it is, yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's to try and say, so what are kind of the um, meta political principles that all parties can agree on in terms of what's good for citizens? And that's, you know, a really hard thing to do. 
but at least Kant gives us a framework for thinking about how to ask those questions, right? So, so is it the reduction of um, poverty or is it the you know, increasing safety, for instance? So, so, so I talk a bit in the book about how there's been a lot of research into kind of um, sexual violence and things like that. And, mm. and, and it's, um, it's obvious that like the people working on that want to reduce the instances of that by having better biological understandings of it here. Yeah. But like understanding what the, the value drivers are behind um, kind of um, sexual violence in, in human beings is, is really important as a kind of first stance to resolving that problem. And also like, why not make explicit that what we're doing in science is trying to reduce the instances of that in the future, right? It doesn't seem like it doesn't seem like we're taking away from good science by saying that it's, it's driven by these values, right? So, so I do think Kant can offer us a way of starting to um, understand the relationship between, um, like, scientific um, objectivity. You know, kind of um, the, the way we use um, kind of our scientific communities to, to have peer review stuff like that, but but also include like values into that discussion as well, and include politics and include you know epistemology. So, well, all that so- says is that we just need uh, we need more folks like yourself doing good good research and, and good science and good studies. So, I mean, there's there's plenty still to pull from from Kant and from biology in general. The, uh, the book is called How Kant Matters for Biology, A Philosophical History. Uh, it's out uh, everywhere now. Uh, where's the best place to uh, find yourself? Um, the best place to find me is on Twitter. Um, I'm Andy Jones Philosophy PhD. Um, yeah, that's probably I'm the, the most kind of common place where you'll pick me up. So yeah. Right. Cool. Very nice. Uh, Andy, this was so much fun. I, I really enjoyed your book. I enjoyed the conversation so much. It's always nice to talk to people. Uh, about philosophy and about big ideas um, and uh, this 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 conversation did not disappoint so I'm, I'm very happy you came on and, and that we got to talk for a couple hours I really appreciate thank it thank you for having me that's been fantastic Cheers. okay alright thank you yeah.